Maybe, just maybe, we've all been drinking a bit more lately due to having, oh, I don't know, nowhere to go, nothing to do, a complete detachment from our former lives, a gnawing and growing existential dread at the collapse of society. Maybe that's just me, I don't know, but I, I was thinking that perhaps it was a good idea to talk about some lower proof cocktails, low ABV drinks, today on How to Drink. I don't know if I would call it a movement or a thing or a happening, but there's been a lot of interest around the idea of low-proof cocktails of later, low ABV cocktails. I'm not talking about no ABV cocktails or mocktails if you prefer, we're gonna save that for another day, but finally, after being requested a lot, I'm gonna do some lower proof drinks. Uh, I've also seen them referred to as session drinks, kind of like taking the idea of a session of drinking. I think that there's session beers as well, which I'm not sure, I don't, I'm not a beer expert. I don't know if that's the same thing as a Saison. I don't think it is. I think a Saison is like a farmhouse thing, but I don't speak French or to, to, at all well. Now, while the current trend around lower proof cocktails is very, well, it's current and new, the idea of intentionally creating a lower proof drink so as to not obliterate your brain so fast, uh, that's been around for a while. So I thought what we could do today is look at some real roots, low proof cocktails, stuff that's been around for a while, because we don't need to reinvent the wheel, okay? There's great stuff already in existence. I'm gonna kick it off with one I've actually never had, by coincidence, the bamboo, but right after this message from my beautiful sponsors. Since I'm talking about low ABV drinks, it seemed like a good time to introduce you to House, who I wanna thank for sponsoring this episode. House is a new aperitif produced by a husband and wife using the good things they grow on their farm in Sonoma. Throughout the year, they have a few different seasonal offerings, but so far I've had a chance to try their two main bottlings that are available year round, bitter clove and citrus flower. I like the bitter clove on the rocks quite a bit, not overpowering, pleasantly earthy bite, refreshing, dry, but not overly bitter. I find the citrus flower one to be actually more classically bitter of the two with a very long floral aftertaste. Both quite good and easy to sip on the rocks with a twist or without. One of the neat things about House is that because of their lower alcohol content, they can ship directly to you. Uh, so that's what they do. Check out their website in the link below for the whole story on House, but you should know that the first 100 people who jump on that link are gonna get $10 off and a free shipping on their first purchase. So check them out. Back to the show. The bamboo uh, cocktail, bamboo cocktail, was invented at the Grand Hotel in Yokohama, uh, I think 1890, by head bartender Louis Eppinger, a German guy, whose name you may see popping up a lot if you're interested in classic golden age cocktails. He was actually a contemporary of uh, Jerry Thomas. Created bamboo and it kind of took off, uh, really caught on in the local area, and then traveled back to the United States and was pretty soon available on menus around. Uh, I think it was a video I saw by Dale DeGroff where he made this and he referred to it as a low proof answer to a Manhattan. And I think he had some historical chops for that too, uh, that it was intentionally intended that way. A common trend for these lower proof cocktails, particularly when we're looking at stuff from the pre 1900s, is the involvement of sherry. Uh, sherry is something that for some reason people don't drink in it. Well, I think people are drinking more of it, but for a long time it had this like reputation as being something that um, alcoholic housewives drank while they were making dinner. <gasps> I wouldn't be so sure of that. Give me the cup. Which is stupid and paternalistic and misogynistic. But it's wonderful stuff. It's fortified wine. I really love sherry, to be honest. Uh, and we're gonna start with, I think one and a half ounces or 45 milliliters of sherry. Uh, this is Tio Pepe Palomino Fino. It's pretty good stuff. I don't know that it would be my first pick, but my liquor store options are more limited lately. Now I'm gonna need one and a half ounces or 45 milliliters of a dry vermouth. Let's use Dolan Dry. It's a great combination of smells already. It smells pretty lovely. Need a dash or two of Angostura bitters. I like my Angostura, so I'm gonna go with two. I need a dash or two of orange bitters, and uh, this is Reagan's orange bitters. Uh, some people like a drop of simple syrup here, apparently. I'm gonna go with a little bar spoon of simple. I'm kind of familiar with this sherry. I think that the combination of flavors here are gonna wake up with just a touch of sweetness. Uh, I am going to stir this drink over ice. One cube. Why do I always use two? Um, for dilution purposes, I won't need all this ice, but I just find, wow, that was very geometric. I just find it makes it easier to stir. And if I always use approximately the same amount of ice, my drinks kind of always turn out the same way because I always stir the same amount, you know? I don't know. 
This is just the thing I do. I like to keep at least one finger on the mixer so I can feel the temperature of the glass. Some people ask me, how do you know when it's done? That's one way to know. It starts to fog up is another one. The one for me though that's big is when the ice starts to feel loose. Put this into a coupe. Very, very uh, pink, pink color here. And we're gonna garnish this with an orange twist. You guys know that you stole my orange from me? I said orange my whole life. That's how we pronounce it where I'm from. And then people started calling me out saying, making fun of it. And now I'm hung up on it. I can't stop saying orange, like I'm some kind of weird out of town or I don't know. And here we have um, a bamboo. My first time ever having one, I'm excited. Very orangey nose. Of course, we just twisted that orange over. What else would you expect? Oh, that's actually really nice. I like that a lot. Pretty nice, there's a bug in it. That's always fun. It's easy to drink, which is good because it's low proof. Um, it really accentuates, I find, the flavor of the vermouth. For me, the sherry is really up in front. I, I think that there's a nuttiness to the taste of sherry. Some people might dispute if that note, maybe nutty is the wrong word, but for me, I kind of always think of it as nutty. It tastes a bit like some kind of like a filbert or something, like maybe a filbert or a macadamia and almond somewhere in that space. And it's a real thirst quencher too. Like it doesn't have that kind of attack in the mouth that a lot of, you know, more proofy drinks do. I mean, it's like, it's pleasant, it's nice. Lightly sweet, but I would not say, it's not overly sweet, it's not cloying at all. I wouldn't even say this is a sweet drink. I would say it's, it's well balanced. The vermouth is there. Yeah, there's, it's, it's, you know what it is? There's a brief moment that comes through as like this herbaceous thing. And then for a second in my head, I thought, ah, the oak from, you know, the aging. But no, I think that's the vermouth. I think that's the little, a little bit of herbaceous bite from the vermouth. I think the, the, this has not been on wood long enough to really taste like oak. It's really good. The problem is I'm like, this is, I'm gonna drink it very fast. <laughs> and then I might have an empty glass, I have to drink another one. Oh, it's a session drink, I get it. So the next drink on this list is one that I already shot, so I'm not gonna shoot it again today, but I will talk about it. This is Sherry Cobbler. Sherry Cobbler is a storied drink. It probably deserves another episode on the show. It is, um, by some accounts, like one of the first cocktails. It goes way, 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 way back. Shows up in Jerry Thomas's book, of course, and Dave Wondrich spends plenty of time talking about it, but it is a lower proof drink. Uh, it's a session drink, you know? I made a Sherry Cobbler a while back on the show, and I stand by that recipe. Uh, that is the way that I would make it today if I were gonna make it again for you today, but I'm not because I got a few drinks to get through and it is literally just me here. So we're gonna do some drinks in this episode that we've already seen and some drinks that we've never seen before. And a lot of you haven't seen it because I know that there are videos, uh, you know, not everybody sees every one of my videos, and that's okay, I forgive you. I mean, you know, you have friends, go out. Who needs, uh, go out, play with your friends. It's fine, I'll just be fine, I'll be fine, I'll be here. It's, it really, it's fine. So this is a drink that goes back to the 1820s, and it's pretty simply made with a little bit of sherry, like an oloroso or an amontillado, some orange slices, a little gum or simple syrup, and ice, shake it up. And then serve it, uh, I, I think serve it on the ice you shook it with, or, you know, if you want, you can put it on fresh ice. It goes with straw, garnish. The garnish is where this drink is made. I think orange slices, mandatory. Mint, mandatory. You know, you th might be thinking, if you're not super familiar with the golden age of cocktails, that this drink would be pretty Spartan. But actually, you know, when this drink was in its heyday, the mid 1800s, things were garnished to the hilt. So, you know, whatever berries you had that were in season, blackberries, raspberries, some cherries, put them on there, you know, go kind of crazy with this thing. You know, the way that people overdo it with the garnish on a Bloody Mary now, this is kind of the grandfather of that. This drink was just meant to be overdone. You should have a salad on top of it. A fruit salad though, not like, don't, don't go with vegetables. Like, don't put kale on it, that would be. No arugula, I'd be bad on this. So the next one is been around for a long time. It's lesser known. It's actually not a 1800s drink. This one is from the 30s, actually. Um, 1934 was probably invented. It's one of the few drinks where we know who invented it, when, and where. You know what, I gotta stop saying that because I feel like I say that so much. It's one of the few drinks where we know who invented it, what, and where. I'm starting to think that we know the histories of a lot of drinks pretty well. Hmm. Yeah, I gotta stop saying that. Uh, so Herbert L. Quick invented this drink while he was the head bartender of the Ben Franklin Hotel uh, in 1934 in Philadelphia. 
It's not named for the monarch, Queen Elizabeth, as there actually was no Queen Elizabeth in 1934. Queen Elizabeth II, the current queen, uh, would not ascend the throne until 1952, and the former Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I, she died in 1603, so she wasn't too relevant at this time. I mean, I suppose she's always relevant. There is a whirlwind within me. No, in fact, it's named after his wife, who was his queen, Elizabeth. I wonder how that got a name. I wonder. There's a couple ways you can name your drink after, a after your wife. Queen Elizabeth. So this drink is shaken. We're gonna shake this guy up. And uh, to do that, I need a shaker. That's how that works. Three quarters of an ounce of lime juice to start. My teeny tiny wimpy knife. This one dry ass lime. I need three quarters of an ounce of Benedictine. I'm gonna use this little miniature bottle because I, uh, I have it. I probably have another bottle around somewhere, but this is the one that was close at hand. I love Benedictine in the drink, so I'm really, I gotta say, I've never had this drink, so I'm really curious uh, about how it's gonna turn out. And one and a half ounces of a dry vermouth. Uh, Dave Wondrich recommends Noli Pratt here. Can't argue with that. I used to have a freezer down here, but I broke it because I'm an idiot. One large cube, little tiny cube, crack it up. I'm gonna go with this guy. Let's strain away. Let's just make a quick little wheel here. So here we go with the Queen Elizabeth. Hmm, smells so lovely. Ooh, that's great. Why is there like a taste of honey there? That's so unusual, I was not expecting I certainly wouldn't expect it to taste like honey. That's fantastic. I mean, that's borderline. It almost tastes like a daiquiri. Very dry daiquiri, but nice. Very nice. Mouth puckering. It's puckeringly tart. Not very sweet, but it doesn't need to be sweeter. Um, I suppose you could add sugar to it, but I wouldn't. I think it's great like this. Kind of reminds me of like a, somewhere between like a last word and a daiquiri, if you can believe it. The Benedictine is such a wild card ingredient. It has so many flavor components in it, that when you put it in a drink like this, what's gonna come to the fore? What you're going to accentuate with vermouth and lime, it's very tough to predict. Um, and I guess what you get is something borderline honey. It tastes like honey. One of the nice things about doing an episode about low ABV drinks is that I can probably finish them all reasonably safely. I don't know. I'm gonna. Very refreshing. This is an outstanding drink for a summer day. Who knew? Who knew a low ABV proof cocktail could be so wonderful? My eyes are starting to tear up because it's so tart, but it's really enjoyably tart. I like the idea of going back and forth between new and ones I've made before, so let's talk about the Americano. This has got roots. This drink was invented way back in the 1860s, believe it or not, at Campari's own bar <laughs> in Italy. It was originally called the Milano Torino because Campari comes from Milan and the vermouth in it comes from Torino. Word is that it acquired the name Americano because during Prohibition, Americans uh, who were of means wanted to travel to places that were a little, uh, whose shores were a little less dry. So Cuba was a destination of choice and of course Europe. Uh, Americans would come to Italy and they became associated with it, ordering it. That's that's the story I read online. Now, I remember once, and I don't remember who told me this, but somebody told me this a long time ago, that you know an Americano coffee isn't called that because Americans drink it, it's called that because it's bitter. It's a pun on amaro, uh, which means bitter in Italian. Amaro, amare, amaro cano, americano, americano. I don't know if that's where that comes from here, but it's certainly a bitter drink. Very easy to make. It's one and a half ounces of Campari. We'll measure one and a half ounces of vermouth. I like a Carpano Antica here. And then generally three ounces of club soda, you know, double the volume. It's bitter, it's bracing, garnish it with a lemon twist. Oh, by the way, the Americano, uh, godfather of the Negroni. The Negroni comes out of the Americano when the Count Negroni wanted an Americano that was a little proofed up. So the bartender switched out his club soda for gin and whoo, there it is. And also the garnish, lemon for an orange and thus was born the Negroni. So. Americano, uh, basically a lower proof Negroni? Sort of, not really, but definitely worth keeping in mind when you're looking for low proof session drinks. I think it's a great one. So let's make it Adonis. This drink is a 19th century drink, 1800s, named after the burlesque show that ran on Broadway of the same name, sometimes credited as being the first Broadway musical, Adonis. 
This is news to me. I'm not like a theater history guy. Um, anyway, the drink was made to celebrate it, kind of the way that like a blood and sand was invented to celebrate the Navarro silent film Blood and Sand. So let's make it. I've never had it before. I don't know if it's any good. It's probably gonna be good. It's another sherry based drink and I like sherry, so we can't go too far wrong. We're gonna need another uh, pour of the Fino. It's a stirred drink. We'll stir it in this mixing glass. Two ounces of our Fino sherry. Uh, we need an ounce of a sweet vermouth, I believe. And I'm gonna go with Carpana Antica. Brings a lot of vanilla to the flavor flavor profiler. Two dashes of orange bitters. Let's crack some ice in there. Boom, 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 boom. Get this out of my way. Get it out of my way. Stir that up. I'm gonna put it in this guy. There she goes. I'm gonna garnish this with an orange twist. Short pull, I like just a short little, little piece. Boom, that's one juicy peel. It's unreal, it makes a sound when it hits. <laughs> that's juicy. Uh, here's an Adonis, a drink I've never had before. Oh wow, it's totally, ooh, I like this. Wow, that's neat. I'm surprised the orange comes in very late. You usually when, the, when you put a twist on it, you get that right up front, but that ooh was when the orange came back. It was a real surprise. It's kind of almost nothing up front. A very subtle sherry sweetness, that nutty flavor of the Fino sherry that I, I like so much. That bitterness, man, the Carpano. Comes through with some interesting bitterness after a little moment of vanilla and orange, orange. Orange comes through very nicely. Um, it's very present, the orange, that little twist. I mean, of course, this is an extremely oily orange. I've never seen an orange, literally, <laughs> when I squeeze the peel, it's like the drink almost gets shot out of the glass. So, you know, there's variables here that are tough to control for. Uh, Antica, good choice here, I think. Um, the, you get a little bit of that bitterness, a little from the wormwood, right? Because it's a vermouth. But it's a lot of vanilla, a lot of round, sweetish, sweet flavors, a lot of woodsy flavors, it, it makes for a very nice drink. And low proof, so away she goes. What the heck? We're gonna talk about the spritz real quick. Um, I think that probably one of the standard, the standard, the standard, uh, low ABV cocktail is a spritz. It's typically made with Aperol. I mean, I think a, technically a spritz is made with Aperol. Aperol and Prosecco and club soda and garnish with an orange twist. Uh, delicious, put it in a big balloon glass, put it over ice, it's a wonderful thing. You know, you can really sit around and enjoy those in a hot summer day. What? And they are really good on a hot summer day, a Prosecco spritz, Aperol spritz. But you know, really, you can make a spritz um, with just about any Amaro or bitter or whatever you wanted, um, or aperitif, and they will all be pretty great. It's tough to go very far wrong. I think that the worst you could do is come up with something that's sort of humdrum. When, way back at the pool, uh, I was partnered up with Luxardo. We made spritzes three ways using some of their Amaros. Stand by those, those are great drinks. And uh, like I said, there's of course the, <laughs> the standard April spritz. So let's talk about a Kira Royale. Yet another drink I've never had. You may notice a trend here with these low proof cocktails that I have not had too many of them. Just hasn't shaken out that way. Kier comes in kind of two variations, well, it comes in several variations. There's a Kier and then the Kier Royale. Kier is a combination of creme de cassis and white wine. The Royale swaps the white wine for champagne. This drink gets its name from Felix Kier, who was a Catholic priest in France during World War II, member of the French Resistance. Apparently helped uh, some 4,000 POWs escape a nearby camp. The drink was invented in his honor to honor him. I don't think that too many people drink a straight Kier. I think the Royale is the way to go. I have read that when you make it with Prosecco, it's called the Kier Petulant, which seems a, a bit harsh, actually. Let's start by opening this bottle of champagne. I'm calling it champagne, but in fact, it is a cava. It is a brute sparkling wine. Freisenet, Freisenet, Blanc de Blancs. Comes from Spain. You know, um, so maybe this is uh, Kier something else. Kier Franciscan, I don't know. This is the uh, sparkling wine that comes for free with your takeout that you order for Mother's Day that you uh, pick up from uh, curbside. Good pop. Uh, creme de cassis is a sweet liqueur made from black currants. Are there better creme de cassis on the market than LaRue? Oh yeah. 
<laughs> I don't have them uh, presently. Uh, so we're gonna use LaRue. Uh, one ounce creme de cassis, you can build this right in the glass. And now I'm gonna put in my four ounces of champagne. So here we have the Cure Royale. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I never had one of these. It is uh, it's a fun color. It's very purple, is that purple? Yeah, purple, I guess. I don't love that. Okay, it's not bad. I mean, it's just not for me. It's kind of sweet. I don't like this drink. Maybe with better ingredients, but boo. And a lot less Cassis. It's just sweet berry champagne. Okay. Low ABV though, so it's on the list. And it's a classic. Not for me. Well, those are some low ABV, low proof session cocktails um, that have been around for a while. That aren't new inventions. That aren't reinventing the wheel. These are things that have just, they've been sitting around waiting for someone to make them. I mean, people are still making them. I'm not rediscovered anything incredible here, but these are some Roots low ABV drinks that you could be making if you have the ingredients at least right now. Different tastes for everybody here too, I think. There are a few very glaring examples that may not be in this episode, and I'm gonna explain why, because they are drinks that I think kind of deserve their own episode. I'm thinking that, that the Grasshopper, which is definitely a low ABV drink, deserves its own episode, a real kind of a breakdown and do a couple variations on a grasshopper. So we're gonna address that in the near future. There's something called Kalamoka. I hope I'm saying that right. It's, a, there's an X in there. It's really tough to pronounce for me, uh, which is a combination of red wine and Coca-Cola from Spain. I've never had it before. I'm very excited to try it. Um, and I think there's definitely something we can do there. It's such a cultural phenomenon. It kind of deserves its own episode as well. We made the bamboo, the Adonis and the uh, Queen Elizabeth and a Cure Royale we talked about the uh, Sherry Cobbler and the Americano and the Spritz, drinks that I have kind of addressed previously. If you like the tools I use in the show, there's a link in the pinned comment in the description below. Uh, the other episodes that are referenced in this, there'll be links down there as well for those. And uh, if you like my show, I hope you'll like, subscribe, drop me a comment, you know, all that stupid crap that I'm supposed to tell you to do as a YouTuber. But mostly I really, I hope you'll watch more episodes. I hope you'll stick around and see more of what I'm doing. You can find me on Twitter at How to Drink with a number in the middle or on Instagram at How to Drink with a number in the middle. Uh, you can find me at Patreon at patreon.com slash Greg from How to Drink. There's like some behind the scenes and uh, sometimes I do exclusive live feast streams there and there are sort of deleted scenes from all these episodes there. And you'll find me also at Twitch at twitch.tv slash Greg from HTD. I'm doing a lot of stuff on Twitch these days. Um, some of it is gaming. Uh, we're playing Dungeons and Dragons over there on Thursday nights. That's exciting. Uh, and we are, uh, and I'm doing stuff here in the bar live, uh, answering your bar related questions there as well and, and making up drinks on the fly. So there's a lot of fun stuff going on at Twitch and I hope you'll join me over there and hang out. It's, uh, we're having a good time. I hope I'm recording because there's a big zero up there. That's kind of freaking me the fuck out. Oh, you motherfucker, you better be recording. Normally at this point, people give me ideas for how to end the episode, but there's nobody here. It's just a camera and an empty garage. So lonely. <laughs>